Coming up on Market to Market, President Trump's infrastructure plan barges into rural America. And catfish farmers fight off foreign competition in a tight market. Those stories and market analysis with John Roach next. So we look back. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, June 9 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. As the stock market rides high over higher profits, climate deals, and federal trade policy changes, those making the purchases that would rev up the country's economic engine have let off the throttle. Figures from the Commerce Department revealed a two-tenths percent drop in April of factory orders for heavy machinery and aircraft, the first decline in nearly half a year. The Purdue CME Ag Economy Barometer held steady at 130 as farmers remained cautiously optimistic about the future. However, low commodity prices continue to weigh heavily on producers. And Wall Street struck another record as the Dow rolled over 21,250 in the final session. As the economy attempts to stay on an even keel eight years after the end of the Great Recession, the nearly half-year-old Trump administration is pushing new ways to jumpstart America. This week, the president focused on a visibly aging infrastructure. He is hoping to get things moving, but the Fiscal Balancing Act could place a heavier burden on state government coffers. Paul Yeager has the details. The optics of the president's plan to rebuild America launched from a Cincinnati marina as coal from West Virginia floated by on barges. We are a nation that created the Panama Canal, the Transcontinental Railroad, and the Internet. If you think about this, the great highway system, the interstate highway system, we don't do that anymore. However, President Trump's announcements on infrastructure are far from concrete. One big detail is the price. Spending $200 billion in public funds to hopefully generate $1 trillion in private investment. The president promised to create a first-class system of roads, bridges, and waterways while reducing red tape to speed up the process. I'm calling on all Democrats and Republicans to join together if that's possible, in the great rebuilding of America. Countless American industries, businesses, and jobs depend on rivers, runways, roads, and rails that are in dire and even desperate condition. Nearly 75 percent of U.S. grain exports move on the nation's rivers annually. But these critical corridors of commerce depend on a dilapidated system of locks and dams that is more than half a century old. And their condition, as you know better than anybody, is in very, very bad shape. It continues to decay. But the 12,000 miles of inland waterways maintained by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, a lifeline for billions of dollars in agricultural trade, remains in jeopardy. The aging lock and dam system is nearly $9 billion behind in repairs. And the 2018 Trump budget slashed funding for the Corps by more than 50 percent, leaving barely enough to construct a single new lock and dam. The National Corn Growers Association applauded the administration's commitment as, quote, farmers rely on our national infrastructure every day to get our products to market quickly, safely, and efficiently. The president's 2018 budget uses conflicting language as it cuts 13 percent from the Transportation Department while pushing shovel-ready jobs. The administration plan cuts a 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act program 
which funded dozens of road, transit, and other projects similar to what Trump called for in his Ohio speech. The president touted traditional energy successes of his developing tenure, citing the opening of a coal mine next week in Pennsylvania and the Dakota Access Pipeline that is now open for business. A $3.8 billion investment in American infrastructure that was stalled and nobody thought any politician would have the guts to approve that final leg. And I just closed my eyes and said, do it. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. As part of his America First agenda, President Trump set in motion a renegotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement. As preparations get underway, the U.S. hammered out an interim deal on Mexican sugar imports this week. While stiff tariffs remain at bay, both sides haven't sugarcoated their dislike of the agreement. Catfish producers also are among those staving off foreign competition. In a sea of increased regulation and limited client base, southern producers are fighting back. Producer Delaney Howell has our cover story. The day for Battlefish Farm's harvest crew starts early. They've been waiting 18 months for this pond of catfish to be ready. Bill Battle, a native of Tunica, Mississippi, and owner of Battlefish Farms, has raised catfish since he can remember. My first recollection of fish farming was uh, riding in the back of a car, watching the little sack fry we had in a bag to bring to the first pond we ever built. And, and, uh, and I guess that was about 1969 or 70. And uh, from there, went on to run the hatcheries and, and, uh, and worked on a fish farm every holiday and summer vacation that everybody else went to Florida, I went to the fish farm. Battle, a Catfish Farmers of America board member, says raising and processing fish at his operation takes up every one of the 24 hours available in a day and requires the help of some 150 employees. Britton Hatcher is the Mississippi Farm Bureau's aquaculture commodity advisor. Catfish in the wild are bottom feeding fish, but the way I try to explain catfish in a farm raised setting, it's just like cattle. Grass fed beef has a different taste than does feedlot. Catfish are the same. In the wild, they're gonna be a little bit different. If you ever watch a catfish being fed, they go out there and throw feed on the water and our fish are just churning all along the top. They're not at the bottom. Battle Fish Farm's 100 ponds produce nearly 10 million pounds of fish every year. When the catfish are ready, a crew harvests the bounty with nets that allow the smaller fish to swim through, letting them grow to a size that turns a profit. Pride of the Pond Battle's processing facility opened in the early 1980s and runs four days per week, depending on demand and the number of fish harvested in nets or purchased from other producers. U.S. farm-raised catfish production soared in the 70s, topping out in the early 2000s. But after foreign imports from trading partners like Vietnam and China, higher production costs, and a weak domestic economy, contributed to total catfish pond acreage falling nearly 65 percent. Today, Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas account for 90 percent of all U.S. production, which tipped the scales at 315 million pounds in 2015, nearly a third of total domestic consumption. Over the past four and a half decades, producers have encountered many changes. Battle and the nearly 185 other catfish producers, concentrated in southern states, are facing some of their greatest challenges in the history of the industry. My father was really involved in the industry and he came home one day and said, look, the malachite that you're using, you got to get rid of it. If the FDA or whoever finds it on the farm, they'll shut, shut us down. You know, it still mystifies me why other countries can use all those banned items and send the fish in here for us to eat and for us to feed our children. You know, if they catch me using it in this country, it's doomsday for me and I don't want to use it. I mean, I want a product that's good for me and good for my kids. I probably eat more catfish than anybody. Prior to March 2016, catfish imports and domestic production were inspected and monitored by the Food and Drug Administration. Years of lobbying in Congress resulted in catfish being classified as a meat in the 2008 Farm Bill. 
After nearly eight years, inspection authority passed to USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service. Under the year-old program, FSIS is nearing the September 1st deadline where 100% of catfish and catfish-like product imports will be inspected. Previously, officials inspected only 2% of this import category. That's could get a vote when the Senate Initially, Senate Republicans Senate led by John McCain of Arizona voted to end the inspection process handled by FSIS and return regulation to the FDA. Several catfish industry members went to Washington, D.C. just days before Congress began its August 2016 recess to rally U.S. House members against the resolution. However, the legislation never made it to the floor. Hatcher, like many others, emphasizes the issue is about food safety and industry image. A fear I have, one batch comes in, gets a lot of people sick, they're going to paint this industry with a broad brush. Nobody's going to want to eat catfish again because they're going to say, that catfish made me sick, when they don't understand that this was from China or Vietnam or wherever it comes from, and this is U.S. farm-raised catfish. Many of those fighting to return inspection to the FDA say those who support increased scrutiny are a small group of southern catfish industry members with a political agenda and not a coalition seeking to identify a food safety issue. The National Fisheries Institute, a nonprofit organization made up of importers, exporters, producers, processors, and restaurants, among others, voiced opposition to the change in procedure and support lawmakers who want the mandate repealed. The reality is the folks who will be hurt the most by this in the long run are U.S. ag exports. Because what's likely to happen is if this program goes forward, there will be a WTO lawsuit from Vietnam or from China, and the U.S. will lose that lawsuit. And when they do lose that lawsuit, there will be retaliatory tariffs placed on U.S. ag exports. And the reason that U.S. ag exports will be targeted is that we don't export any catfish. Not a single whisker of catfish is exported from this country. Despite current rules, two recent developments may gut the new inspection protocol. President Trump's proposed budget cuts could send the inspection program back to the FDA, and requests by Vietnamese trade officials to remove the new inspection program were made to top Republicans, just as the signatures dried on a series of trade deals totaling $15 billion. As the legislation wrangling continues in Congress, Battle, like other producers, know they will continue to face opposition from those in Washington and foreign competition. And I told somebody not long ago, old boy trying to raise catfish in Mississippi never thought he'd be they need him to go to Washington and knock on doors in the House of Congress. I mean, it takes a lot to put fish in a box these days. It, it really does. For Market to Market, I'm Delaney Howell. Next, the Market to Market Report. The expectation of lower year-over-year -year ending stocks and an early arrival of the dog days of summer made for higher commodity markets even before Friday's midday release of the June WASDE report. For the week, July wheat gained 16 cents and the nearby corn contract rose 15 cents. Sales to unknown destinations fueled the fire as the July soybean contract gained 20 cents. July meal added $4 per ton. In the softs, July cotton continued to shrink, falling $1 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, June Class 3 milk futures lost 24 cents. The livestock sector was mixed. The August cattle contract fell two twenty, and nearby feeders dropped $4.55. The July lean hog contract continued its eight-week streak, moving 72 cents higher. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained 57 basis points. Crude oil fell $1.83 per barrel. Comex Gold drained $8.80 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index retreated more than seven basis points to finish the week at 368.50. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is our senior market analyst, John Roach. John, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here. We're glad to have you. But before we get started, in case you want to go over things again, you can listen to our Market Analysis and Market Plus podcast anytime at iptv.org mtom. John, I want to open up to you with a, a fairly broad question. 
We've seen the U.S. dollar bouncing here around this uh, 96, 97 uh, basis point mark here on the dollar index. And yet we've seen foreign currencies really all over the board. We talked about Brazil and the Brazilian real last week. What other currencies should people have an eye on in the world of agriculture today? Well, I think you know one of our major uh, trading partners is Mexico, and another one is Canada. And we need to look at currency relationships with both of those countries, as well as currency relationships uh, uh, with China and, and with some other people, and how we compare versus Brazil to China and so forth. Uh, what's very interesting is to see the movement that these currencies have made prior to the election, and then directly after following the election, and for several weeks following that, and now more recently, as the uh, things in Washington appear to be a little less certain, the currencies have relaxed quite a little bit, or the dollars relaxed quite a bit. Okay. As an example with the, with the Mexican peso, uh, prior to the election, uh, the, the peso was trading in the neighborhood of 18 or 19 pesos to the dollar, and then right after the election, the peso went off on a tear and ran all the way up to 22 pesos to the dollar, and now we're back down to 18 today. So what does that tell you from a grain demand or meat demand perspective for a U.S. producer? Why do we care? Well, if you take a move from 22 to 18, that's a that's a four-point move, if my math is right, and a four-point move on a on a, a 22 base is about a 20% move. So it would be as if you're a buyer of something, and the buy and the and the seller called you up and said, "Look, because of currencies, I'm discounting the price by 20% from what it was in November. Are you interested?" And certainly a 20% move for almost any commodity is a significant number, and and it is also takes away some of the fears that we've had that maybe we're going to lose all that business, the, the renegotiation of NAFTA. I mean, we, we really had a lot of things hitting the intersection of the road at the same time, all worrying us about this new administration. And yet, it, it, it's, the markets have not worried nearly as much as what a lot of people were. All right. Well, now we're still a little worried as we take a look at Chicago wheat. Uh, it doesn't seem to have much, much climbing power. Up 16 cents on the week. Biggest move to the upside in quite a little while. Can it run any higher? Well, it certainly can. I mean, uh, uh, we're will being... it run any higher, John Roach? I guess that's the question. <laughs> well, uh, the, always with the weather kind of markets, you just have to say it depends on whether it rains or doesn't rain. I mean, it, and it depends on whether the forecast changes or doesn't change. And I've been around this business long enough to tell you that a forecast for no rain on a Friday night has turned into being over three inches by next Wednesday. So you have to be really careful in these kind of markets because we probably have done very little actual damage to the crop out there. Now, in the case of spring wheat, that's a little different. The spring wheat crop, we're, we've lost bushels, and, and the market's adjusted to that, and it may need to adjust more. Uh, we'll have to, to see how that kind of shakes out. Uh, they've got some difficulties up in Canada as well. You know, so the, the high-protein wheat market is going to be an entity of itself compared to the, the ordinary pro. And so you have to think in, in those kind of terms. Uh, but in general, we've just been in a sideways kind of a market here, and, and so we've had a run-up based on weather issues, and we can turn around and lose that just as quickly as we gained it. We, 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 we had uh, wheat sell signals uh, okay. for spring wheat and for Kansas City wheat, and so we executed. We, we, we uh, talked to our people about if you're needing to sell some wheat, use this rally to be selling some wheat. Uh, we don't have a bullish long-term fundamental picture for wheat. The government re reissued the numbers again today, and we're plentiful in supply. Yes, and so you have to act with an accordance of this is a weather scare, could turn into a weather problem, but you have to sell into it and then be careful with your position and be prepared to, you may have to defend your, may want to defend your position using a call option to reestablish a, a level of, of insurance in case prices rise. Gotcha. Now, you talked about moving sideways. We saw corn trading sideways for almost three months. It was not very exciting to watch week on week. This week, especially, well, in old, both old and new crop, we shot up out of that range. And we've got a question here from one of our followers. This is from Nate. In Inwood, Iowa, he's on Twitter at Newendorp, and we encourage all of you to uh, send in your questions via Twitter and Facebook. He says it seems like corn is primed for a weather rally. John, what resistance levels should we be looking at to get some new crops sold? Are there price points that you want to be pretty aggressive making sales? We called our customers uh, with a uh, corn sell signal uh, this week. Uh, uh, yesterday, I believe it was. I'm losing my track. I've been traveling, so I'm losing track of my days a little bit. Uh, but uh, we, yeah, so we we initiated corn as our first sell signal for the year. Wow. And so we think it's a, uh, at a price level that we need to reward the market. We have rallied on the weather. And that's the thing that people have to be careful about. It's not a matter of will we rally next week on the weather. We, we may or may not. But we rallied this week on weather. 
In addition to that, we've stimulated the technical guys to cover short positions. Uh, and so, uh, that, so we've had really two things working for us this week. We may have two working for us next week or only one. And so we have to be cautious about that. So my suggestion to people is it's time to be looking at the old crop corn that's in the bin. You've held it for a long time. Okay. You've been rewarded with better prices. Don't miss it. Okay. All right. And make some new crop sales as well then. I think you make new crop sales where you don't have storage. Okay. Uh, rushing out and selling corn with a three in front of it for in a cash bid okay. is just not something I can get very enthusiastic about unless, again, I don't have much choice, in which case, okay, I'll go ahead and make the sale on strength. When the market pulls back and I get a buy signal, I'll replace the paper in Chicago. All right. Soybeans, John Roach, we've got another little move to the upside here. We've got a big crop coming out of Brazil. Is there still opportunity to get some sales in here on the new crop side of soybeans? I think there still is. Um, I, I, I don't want to hold out a tremendous amount of optimism. I don't have that. But this, let me, let me play this back to you a different way. We just harvested the biggest crop in South America they've ever harvested, bar none, after us harvesting the biggest crop of beans we've ever harvested, bar none, last fall. And so here we are with all those supplies, and we just made the harvest lows in Brazil, and now we've started to rise a little bit. You know, uh, we're just up a little off of the lows. And so um, uh, I'm a willing seller on beans, uh, but I'm not an aggressive seller here, and I think we still have some opportunity. We don't have them planted yet. You know, and so we don't know for sure what our acreage and what our situation is yeah. going to be. And so if I'm going to play the drought game, I want to play a little of that with the soybean market, too. Gotcha. You, ha you don't currently have a sell signal on. In Not currently. Beans. Nope. Okay. In fact, as we came out of a buy signal just last week. Okay. So, when we bounced off those lows. So we bounced off of the lows and, and the market's positioned uh, in a way that we could still get some further recovery. U.S. farmers don't have very many beans to sell. And so the pressure is going to come from South American farmers. And if you're a South American farmer, why would you want to rush out and sell beans, turn into the paper currency, which is deteriorating about as fast as anything out there? So it makes sense to hang on to the product as long as you can until you can get the, the alignment, the currency and everything aligned correctly. You bet. Well, now, John, let's take a look at the livestock market. We had live cattle trade at 135, 136 on the cash market this week, and yet we saw the futures market continue to pull back on this front month June live cattle contract. At what point do you think we're going to see that thing start to move up and try to converge? Or is cash going to have to come down? I think the cash market may have the problem. I think we, okay. may, I think we may be fully priced in this market, including fully priced into a weather situation. And so it would it seemed to me that, uh, that we're at some pretty decent kind of price. And if you look at the, at the report out today from the USDA, fourth quarter cattle, we're going to be swimming in fourth quarter cattle. And so the, the thing that we've, that we've had that's been very favorable here is this whole discussion with China and overseas demand where you know, uh, exports in the month of uh, March were excellent, I think 25% over, yeah. uh, the best they've been since back in the 70s. It was really very strong kind of demand. And so we've pushed that in through the market, and the market's rallied. Mm -hmm. Now we need to pay attention to the fourth quarter, make sure we keep our rears covered going into that fourth quarter. So at these price levels, are you willing to sell on the board for fourth quarter if, if I'm buying some uh, feeders today? Yes. Okay. Yes. I think you have to look at the board and be willing to be a scale-up seller from here. Now, on the feeder cattle side, for those folks that are seeing these, uh, these decent returns coming back for cattle leaving the lot today, we're pouring that right into the feeder cattle market, as we often do. Is that a good idea, given the swimming in cattle in the fourth quarter? It's okay as long as we can m m market our way through. The thing here that is that's so... Uh, uh that has a potential to be so important is, is Chinese demand. I mean, we, we talked about the, the, uh, the Chinese. Is, we thought we were going to have trade problems with the Chinese, and then we went from that to the, it seemed like the, the, they came to Mar Largo down in my neighborhood, yeah. didn't invite me, and, uh, <laughs> and, had, uh, uh, and, and came away with, with a much better relationship, it seems. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get that business going, I mean, there's, there's lots of possibilities out there. But at the moment... I've got to look at what I have in front of me, and I've got a lot of numbers to deal with in the fourth quarter. I'd like to get hedges on. Okay. Now, I want to take us into the hog market. We've got a question here. This was, of course, World Pork Expo Week in Des Moines, so we've got hogs on our mind. And we've got a question from Doyle in Alma, Arkansas. He wants to know, what's the future of lean hog prices going to look like if they continue to go up? How's that going to change the industry? 
Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I mean, the industry has surprised everybody with its ability to expand throughout thick and thin almost. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so our numbers uh, uh, are, are bigger. And the, the thing to kind of keep in mind when you're talking long term like that, I saw, I saw a report that was a very well written report by Bill Gary that, that talked about the Chinese uh, uh, slaughter levels compared to the United States slaughter levels. And, and, uh, and the 5% of their imports in China comprise 30% of the, of the world's exports. Wow. And so they are so big relative to the rest of us that the economic situation in China and the relationship there, that can really change the longer term outlook on, on the hog industry. On the short term, as we've pressed up north of $80, $80 per hundred, we're, we're closed in on, uh, on 82. Is there the strength left, given the fundamentals we've got today, to move us even higher? Well, certainly perhaps, but we're there. Okay. I, mean, I mean, if you were standing back, putting together a plan some weeks or months ago, you would have been, at this point in here, I'm going to start hedging them up. And, and I think that's what you should be doing. I think you should be looking out into the balance of this year and trying to find some prices that you can be satisfied and, uh, and put some protection underneath of it. Do you want to sell out any further than, say, December of this year? Are you looking at 2018 sales at all? No, I wouldn't go okay. any further than that. Not quite time for it yet. Maybe, but I'm, I'm, I, I'll, I'll be comfortable for a little while. Okay. Well, John Roach, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this week. Thanks, Mike. It's been great. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market. However, John and I will keep the conversation going, including answering more of your questions during Market Plus, which is available in podcast and video form on our website. While you're there, follow the links to our Twitter feed. Tweet us your questions via at Market to Market, and we'll get you the answers either during our market analysis or plus segments. And join us again next week when we see how one group of hog farmers is producing pork with a purpose. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.